Afterwards tab near the top of the page. Afterwards is also available as a podcast. And now on Book TV, we're live with author and professor Noam Chomsky, who over the next two hours will take your calls and questions via email, text, and social media. His books include Hopes and Prospects, Consequences of Capitalism, and the forthcoming Notes on Resistance. Well, it was in 2003 <clears throat> that philosopher and author and linguist Noam Chomsky first appeared on this program in depth, and we've invited him back to take your calls and talk to you one more time. Since 2003, he's written dozens of books, and one of those books was Consequences of Capitalism. Here's Professor Chomsky from 2021 talking about one of his more recent books. major poll just came out from Pew Research, major polling agency, in which they asked people, they gave people a choice of 15 serious problems, asked them to rank them in terms of urgency, divided by Republicans and Democrats. Among Republicans, the very last one at the bottom was global warming. At the top, was illegal immigrants and uh, the, uh, the debt. The debt incidentally became a problem last November 4th. Uh, up until then, the debt was fine. Republicans were creating it to enrich very rich people, so it was no problem. November 4th, Biden took it over, might use it to help others, poor people, terrible, major problem. It's not that the people who said that actually believe it. It's that's what they hear in the bubble in which they're contained. You listen to the Murdoch TV station, Fox News, you read the Murdoch press, that's what you hear. And when you're stuck in that bubble, that's what you believe. So the real problems are illegal immigrants, terrible problem. Uh, the debt suddenly became a problem. And at the bottom of the list is destroying the environment in which life can be sustained. All of these are signs of the collapse, not only of the arena for rational discourse, but just general social collapse. The social order is collapsing. It didn't just happen by itself. It happened because of a plague that was set in motion 40 years ago we discuss a lot of it in the book. It's the plague of neoliberalism. It was actually started in the 70s, a massive business campaign to institute it, but it took off with Reagan and Thatcher. And if you look at their prescriptions, it's perfectly obvious what's gonna happen. So Reagan's inaugural address said, uh, the government is the problem not the solution. Decisions have to be taken out of the hands of government. Well, they don't stop being made. Where are they gonna be made? In the private sector. They're gonna be made by powerful corporate tyrannies, which is what corporations are, uh, unaccountable to the public. The government, of course, has a flaw. It's partially accountable to the public, it can be controlled somewhat by the public. Private tyrannies are free, no accountability. Uh, second point was Milton Friedman, the economic guru who pronounced that corporations have one responsibility to their owners, stake shareholders, period, and management, nothing else. Uh, corporate rights are a gift from the public. There's plenty of advantages that come from incorporating, it's a gift, but they don't have any responsibility just to themselves. Well, put this, these two things together, hand decisions over to private tyrannies who have no responsibility other than to enrich themselves. Uh, Margaret Thatcher comes along and says, there's no society 
just individuals uh, somehow managing on the market that they're supposed to survive in. Uh, first step that both Reagan and Thatcher took was to destroy any possible defense against this assault. <clears throat> Their first steps first were to attack labor unions with uh, actually illegal measures like strike breakers. That opened the door to corporations do the same. The one way people have to defend themselves, namely by organizing, taken away, put all this together. Do you have to be a genius to figure out what's going to happen? Well, actually, 40 years later, it was studied by uh, the Rand Corporation, super respectable American corporation. Uh, they uh, tried to estimate the transfer of wealth, robbery, we should call it, the transfer of wealth from the lower 90% of the population, middle class and working class, to the very top, which turns out to be a fraction of 1%. Their estimate was about $50 trillion during the 40 years of neoliberalism. It's a vast underestimate. They didn't include other things, which are now on the front pages. When Reagan came in, he opened the spigot to businesses to do whatever they liked. Tax havens had been illegal before that and blocked by the Treasury Department. Opened it up. It's probably another tens of trillions of dollars. Uh, changed the rules on corporate management, which the government set, uh, allowing CEOs to pick to buy, to be uh, compensated with stock options instead of salaries. That means anything you can do to raise the stock, like buyback stocks, great. May ruin the corporation, but good for you to get a higher income. As a result, also, of course, executives were permitted to pick their own board, the board that would determine their salary. What do you think is going to happen? Okay, just take a look at the figures. I mean, CEO salaries just skyrocketed, carrying all of top management along with them, extended to the public sector, university presidents, hospital presidents, and so on. Meanwhile, majority of the population gets by from payday to payday in a precarious existence. It's a major assault on the population, and it's happened all over the world, Australia, Europe, not as severe as the United States, but severe. Effect of that is people are angry, disillusioned, resentful, very easy prey to demagogues of the Trump variety who says, I'll save you, you know, uh, and uh, will and just distrust for everything. Why should I believe what the Center for Disease Control says about uh, the pandemic? They're probably just run by crooks in Washington, liberal elites. So I don't believe anything they say. So you have a breakdown of the social order. It's happening over much of the world. Live from his home in Tucson, Arizona, where he's an emeritus professor at the University of Arizona, is Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky, what, what issues, what's on your mind these days? Well, there are... Lots of things going on in the world. Right now, there are background. One of the major ones is, of course, the war in Ukraine. There's many others, and there are background issues. Uh, we are, like it or not, the human species is racing to imminent disaster. Uh, there are two huge problems. One is the growing threat of nuclear war, which would basically end modern civilization as we know it. Uh, the other is uh, destruction of the environment, inexorable. We know it has to be done. We're not doing it. If we don't turn that corner pretty soon, 
we'll reach irreversible tipping points and it'll just be a matter of slow uh, moves towards catastrophe, irrevocable catastrophe. That in addition to what is right on the front pages, that's in the background of it. So there's plenty to be on everyone's mind. Well, Professor Chomsky, you've been active for decades on nuclear war, economic policy, social justice. What's the progress that you think you've made or that the world has made? There has been, over long periods, there has been progress. We happen to be, uh, we happen to have been for the past 40 years in a period of serious regression. But uh, there are ups and downs before. If you check, uh, think back to what the society was, say in 1960, uh, 60 years ago, uh, this was a society in which we literally had uh, laws against miscegenation which were so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them. The one drop of blood laws. Uh, we had uh, uh, anti, uh, the rights of women were still not recognized. It wasn't until 1975 that uh, women had the legal right, guaranteed legal right, to serve on federal juries. That means to be regarded as peers, as persons, not property, which they basically were in the British common law that the country took over. Uh, there were, uh, uh, in, in many respects, uh, minimal rights were not respected. Well, all that's changed. That's an improvement. Uh, in uh, beginning in the late 1970s, there was a shift in the nature of the state capitalist system, is what this was described in the previous comment, the move towards the neoliberal system uh, that has been uh, quite harsh for the general population here and in fact across the world led to enormous concentration of wealth, a precarious existence for many, uh, led to feelings of uh, understandable feelings of anger, resentment, uh, distrust of authority, uh, contempt for institutions. That can take positive forms. Let's have changes for the better. And there are such elements. Can also take very dangerous forms. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 90 years ago when there was, as today, a very serious threat, the threat of the depression, deep depression, much worse than anything today. My own extended family was first immigrant, new, new immigrants, uh, first generation immigrants, working class, mostly unemployed. There were, and this was worldwide, there were two ways out of the depression. One was taken by the United States. The US led the way towards a social democratic revival uh, committed to, it was impelled by a revived militant labor movement, which uh, CIO organizing militant labor tactics led the way to the New Deal measures, which pioneered post-war social democracy, an enormous lift for the population. That was one way out. The other way out was what happened in Europe, uh, sank to the depths of fascist horror. Those were the way out, ways out. 
actually uh, there are some resonances today would be bitter ironic if the United States continues to unravel and uh, moves towards a kind of proto-fascism while Europe hangs on to the shreds of social democracy that have resisted the neoliberal assault and perhaps revives, revives these very positive tendencies. Could have, doesn't have to, the choice is in our hands. And meanwhile, there are imminent problems. The war in Ukraine is in the front page headlines. It's not the only one. Literally millions of people are facing starvation in Afghanistan. Millions of people facing imminent starvation. People who have a little bit of money can't go to the markets where there is food to buy food for their starving children because the banks are shut. They can't get access to their money. Where's the money? In New York banks. The U.S. refuses to release to the people of Afghanistan their own money. Uh, banks are supposed to be fiduciary institutions. You place your money in them with the assurance that it's yours to attain when you need it. Not in this case. The U.S. government has stepped in, not just in this case, others too, to block people from getting their own money. Now, there is a pretext for this. The pretext is we have to assure that victims of 9-11 have a right to compensation from Afghans who had nothing to do with 9-11 the rural people of Afghanistan who were starving had nothing at all to do with 9-11. In fact, those with good memories will recall that the Taliban offered total surrender, which meant, would have meant handing over to the United States the suspects in the 9-11 attack, the Al-Qaeda suspects, and remember, at the time, they were suspects. The FBI informed the press months later that they suspected them but didn't have definitive evidence. But the Taliban offered to turn them over. The U.S. reaction was, we do not do surrenders. Romney, echoed by George Bush. Uh, Rumsfeld, sorry, uh, echoed by George Bush, uh, W. Bush. Well, now the Afghan people have to starve to death because we hold their funds. And there are other things happening in the world. So Thankfully, there seems to have been a, an agreement for a two-month reduction of uh, fighting in Yemen, the worst humanitarian disaster in the world, according to the United Nations. The Saudi government, which is ma the main force responsible for the disaster, along with the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, Saudi Arabia had been blockading in fact, intensifying its blockade of the only port in which food and uh, oil can be imported into the starving country. The official death toll last year was 370,000 people. Uh, the actual death toll is unknown. Again, the United Nations warns that hundreds of thousands of children are facing imminent starvation. The Saudi and Emirati Air Forces 
cannot function without U.S. equipment, U.S. intelligence, U.S. training, U.S. repair parts. We were assisted by Britain at a lesser level, a few others, but the U.S. is in the lead. Well, these are things we can change, the things that should be uppermost in our minds always, or what can we do? What can we do about suffering, misery, major problems in the world, whether it's existential problems that threaten the existence of the species, like global warming and nuclear war, or whether it's the terrible, miserable suffering of people of Ukraine under brutal, violent aggression by the Russian army, or people starving to death in Afghanistan, or in Yemen, we can mention other things. But what can we do about all those things? That's what we have to be asking ourselves. That's what should be in everyone's <clears throat> mind. And this is your chance to talk with Noam Chomsky. If you've been interested in public policy for the last 50, 60 years, chances are you've heard of Professor Chomsky, perhaps even read some of his hundreds of books. The numbers are on the screen, 202 is the area code, 748-8200 for those of you in the East and Central time zones, 748-8201 if you live in the Mountain and Pacific time zones. You can also send a text message in. Please include your first name and your city. 202-748-8903 for text messages only. We also have several social media ways of getting a hold of us. We'll scroll through those on the screen. I wanna quote Professor Chomsky from one of your more recent books, Requiem for the American Dream. And you say that some of the problems of governance in the US today stem from an excess of democracy. Why do you say that? Actually, I didn't say that. I quoted it. The quote is from the, a very important study about uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 1975. It's the, it's the first study of the Trilateral Commission. Trilateral Commission is an international commission of liberal internationalists. You get a rough idea of their uh, political stances by the fact that the Carter administration was drawn almost completely from the ranks. So the that a group of people in the United States, their counterparts in Europe and Japan, liberal internationalists were the uh, Trilateral Commission. They came out with a very important report called The Crisis of Democracy. They were responding to the activism of the 1960s, which considerably civilized the society, it led to the developments that I mentioned briefly before. Uh, the Trilateral Commission warned that there's a crisis of democracy. The crisis is what you quoted, an excess of democracy. There's too much democracy. What's happening, they described during the 60s, is that segments of the population that are supposed to be passive and obedient, began to try to enter the political arena to press their own demands. These are what are often called special interests. Young people, old people, working people, women, farmers, uh, uh, minorities. These people are not supposed to be making noises in the political arena. They're supposed to be quiet, quiet, obedient, apathetic, show up every couple of years to push a button, go home, what's called an election, then go home and let 
their betters uh, uh, decide for them what to do. Uh, well, that excess of democracy, they said, is putting too much of a burden on the, on the state. Can't do it. So we must have what they called moderation in democracy. People should return to their passivity and obedience. Uh, they also talked about particular sectors of the society, like the universities. They said the universities and the churches are not doing their job of indoctrination of the young. Their phrase, not mine. We have to do better indoctrination of the young so that they aren't out there in the streets protesting the Vietnam War, uh, calling for civil rights, for women's rights, uh, uh, other things which are just too much. So that's the liberal internationalists. But there was actually another major document that came out at about the same time, also in response to the activism of the 60s. It's the Powell administration by, uh, it was meant to be secret. This is the man who Richard Nixon appointed to the Supreme Court, Justice Powell, a little bit later. Uh, Powell issued a memorandum to the Chamber of Commerce, to the business world. And it was in a way similar to the Trilateral Commission report, but much harsher. What it uh, the, the document was intended to be confidential, but it surfaced pretty soon. So it's available publicly and was then. The Powell Memorandum urged the business community to take up a forceful reaction to the attack on business that was going on in the 60s. They say businessmen are being persecuted. Uh, the rate of profit is declining. Uh, we're, we're under attack. Uh, the universities have been taken over by uh, crazed radicals led by Herbert Marcuse, who almost nobody ever heard of. Uh, the business world is under attack by Ralph Nader, who is demanding that uh, uh, automobiles have uh, safety measures built in and, and uh, moving for consumer rights and consumer safety in other domains. So the business world can't tolerate all these attacks. And he, then he went on to say, look, we have the resources, we have the money, we can fight back. We can refuse to accept this attack on our power and privilege. And in fact, that resonated. And it was the part of the background which led to the neoliberal reaction that I was quoted in the early remarks before the program began. The roughly $50 trillion robbery of the middle class and working class that's taken place in the past uh, 40 years since they started in the late Carter years, escalated under Reagan in Britain, under Thatcher, spread around the world under US power, structural adjustment programs, which imposed by the IMF, which under US domination, which had a devastating effect in much of the global South, uh, more than I can talk about now, but going back to excess of democracy, that was the phrase from the Trilateral Commission report, which I did write about when it appeared and I've referred to since. But those two documents set a kind of ideological framework, one from the liberal internationalists, another from the business run right wing, uh, they kind of set the frame in which over the coming years, the neoliberal programs were developed, imposed. Uh, we've been living under that assault for 
40 years with pretty harsh effects. I should, I mean, there's actually harsher effects in other countries. So the, the, uh, what actually happened um, for, uh, in the late uh, 70s, there was a, what was called staff, uh, pretty high inflation in the United States. And the, uh, the Carter administration uh, responded to it the, uh, with uh, a very sharp rise in interest rates, which increased under the Reagan years. Well, during the 1970s, countries like Mexico and other countries of the South had been urged by the World Bank, US run World Bank, they'd been urged to take out extensive loans, mostly from US banks, Citibank, it's now this city group, a conglomerate, many others, and they were deeply in debt. Well, when the uh, high interest rates were introduced, their debt is uh, linked to US interest rates. They were in deep trouble. They couldn't pay, they began to default. They had to take aid loans from the International Mon Monetary Fund, which imposed harsh conditionalities. You had to cut back social spending, cut back efforts of development, uh, uh, and uh, other similar measures which devastated the populations. And they had horrifying effects in much of the third world, uh, Yugoslavia, which had been more or less functioning country, uh, fell apart under the impact of uh, the structural adjustment programs, which intensified ethnic conflict, laid the background for the horrors that took place in the early 90s. Uh, the worst case was actually Rwanda. In the 1970s, there already had been significant conflicts between Hutu and Tutsi, mostly in Burundi, but it's basically the same conflict that my friend Edward Herman and I had written about it in the 1970s. 1980s, Rwanda, like other countries, was hit very hard by the structural adjustment programs. And the society, which was already very fragile, collapsed in the conflicts that existed uh, were extensively intensified. Well, I won't go into the details, but that's part of the background for the horrendous developments that took place a few years later in the 1990s. Uh, events have, actions have consequences. Maybe you don't anticipate them, but you should. Well, that was the third world, the global south, in the rich countries like the United States, it's pretty much what was described by the Rand Corporation. Well, that's all part of the neoliberal reaction to the former period of what's called sometimes regimented capitalism, state capitalism based on New Deal measures. It's worth remembering how far we've moved from those days. I take Dwight Eisenhower, the last conservative president in the traditional sense of the word conservative. Uh, Eisenhower, if you read his statements, sounds like a flaming radical today. Eisenhower said, uh, any person who doesn't accept New Deal measures the measures of social welfare developed in the New Deal um, and continued in following years. Anyone who doesn't accept these measures doesn't even belong in our political system. That's Eisenhower. Anyone who denies working people the right to unionize, the firm essential right, 
such a person doesn't belong in our political system. Well, that was the 1950s, continued for some years into the 60s. Then we get into the reaction, which escalated under Reagan. Compare Eisenhower with what you hear today from the remnants of what, what remains of the party that he represented. It's quite a change. Tells us a lot about the regression of the past 40 years. Professor, let's get some of our callers involved here and let's begin with Barbara in Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts. Barbara, please go ahead and ask your question of Noam Chomsky. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chomsky, for your amazing career. Um, continuing with President Eisenhower, his famous statement about um, the emergence of the military-industrial complex. So we've all watched decades of grotesque spending on weapons, but now we see this conflict in Ukraine where tiny munitions like stingers and javelins and switchblade drones and uh, other kinds of drones, these tiny micro weapons are able to take out the elephantine macro weapons of the tanks and the jet fighters and the naval ships. What do you make of this transition to micro um, warfare and its implications? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It uh, heralds a new era of warfare, which is more dangerous, more threatening uh, to everyone. But let me just ask a slightly different question, if you don't mind. I mentioned before that we should be concerned constantly with what we can do and what we should do. Well, one thing we can do is send weapons. And there's an argument for that. Ukraine is under foreign attack from a brutal military force, which has no mercy, uh, and they have a right to defend themselves. But there's another question. What is our goal? Do we want to escalate the war? More Ukrainians die? More destruction? Or do we want to move towards a peaceful negotiated settlement. One of the most respected individuals in the U.S. diplomatic corps, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, highly respected, properly individual with a wonderful record. A couple days ago, he came out in an interview and said, U.S. policy seems to be to fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian. That's the policy. We'll keep, if we've formulated no feasible goals that can lead to an exit from this tragedy. So we can keep pouring in arms, we're good at that, to escalate the fighting. More Ukrainians will die, more Russians will die, goes nowhere, just towards further escalation. Well, is there a possible diplomatic settlement? Yes, there is. Jess Freeman outlined it once again. Everyone knows what it is. The settlement, this has been going on for 30 years, I should say, not just started today. The settlement is, in rough outline, a neutralized Ukraine, not part of a military bloc uh, and an internal settlement that will guarantee the rights of the Russian speaking minority, provide a probably some form of federal solution like Switzerland, Belgium, others uh, in which uh, minority groups have a degree of autonomy in their own regions. It's actually formulated in an agreement called Minsk II. Some version of that 
has to be the possible outcome. And as Freeman again stressed, if we don't want to just fight to the last Ukrainian, we have to offer uh, Vladimir Putin an escape hatch. He has to have some way to escape from this without what amounts to suicide. If we tell him, or if we send our current message, you're going to face war crimes trials. Uh, nothing you can do about it. Sanctions will continue no matter what happens. We're telling him, fight on to the last Ukrainian. It might sound bold and, uh, uh, you know, Winston Churchill impersonation sounds very heroic, uh, but for the Ukrainians, it's a death warrant. We have to come out with a proposal. We have to support, I should say, the proposals that are on the table have been for a long time for a settlement that offers Putin some kind of escape. Uh, uh, like it or not, that's a necessity. And it will have to be based on neutralization of Ukraine and uh, some kind of uh, diplomatic arrangement for uh, a degree of autonomy for the Russian-oriented areas. Now, those things are on the table. U.S. isn't supporting them. The U.S. actually has an official policy. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have been reported in the United States press, though at least I can't find it. Uh, but the policy is there. You can read it in government documents. Actually, I've quoted it repeatedly in things I've been writing. Uh, the policy was set in September 2021. September 1st, 2021, there was a joint statement of the U.S. and Ukraine. Notice this is a couple of months before the Russian invasion. The document is basically a policy statement of the United States reiterating and amplifying the policy that had been in effect for many years. It's worth reading. First says uh, the door to Ukrainian entry into NATO is wide open. We're inviting you to join NATO. And it says the United States will intensify the sending of advanced military weapons to Ukraine. It will continue with joint military efforts in, in Ukraine, U.S. It's called NATO, but it means U.S. Uh, uh, Ukrainian military operations. Uh, all of this at placing weapons within Ukraine uh, aimed at Russia. All of this is part of the enhanced uh, NATO uh, admissions program. You should really look at the exact wording. I'm paraphrasing it, but it's roughly that. Well, that's a call for the horrors that have followed. And it didn't just start then. It's been going on for actually 28 years. You look back to the uh, Clinton, to the, let's go back to the George H.W. Bush administration, the first President Bush in 1990, 1991, Soviet Union was collapsing. There were intensive discussions with George Bush, James Baker, Secretary of State, uh, his Russian counterpart, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Germans, Hans Genscher, Helmut Kohl, who were very extensively involved in this. The question was, what would be the shape of the post-Cold War world with the Soviet Union collapsing? Well, then there were several visions. A Gorbachev's vision was what he called a common European home from the Atlantic, from Lisbon 
all the way to Vladivostok. No military blocks, common European home, mutual accommodation. This was actually an extension of a program of Charles de Gaulle in earlier years, Vidi Brandt. Emmanuel Macron recently has been pressing something similar, uh, a common European home from the Atlantic to the Urals, uh, incorporating Russia within a, a, a European and maybe Eurasian uh, uh, peaceful system with no military blocks. That was one uh, vision. The other one is, this is, goes back 50 or 60 years, is the US vision called Atlanticist, based on the Atlantic Alliance, based on NATO in Europe, which the US dominates and controls. That's a deep issue in world affairs. It goes back to the end of the Second World War. Will Europe be subordinated to the United States within the Atlanticist NATO framework, or will it move towards a European common home along the lines of de Gaulle, Willy Brandt's so-called Ostpolitik, uh, Gorbachev's proposals in 1990. Well, this, the US had no interest in actually opposed the human European common home, but it did have a compromise version. And that was what was agreed by Bush and Baker in the United States, Genscher and Kohl in Germany, Gorbachev in Russia. NATO, uh, Germany would be unified uh, and would join NATO, which is quite a concession on the part of the Russians. Recall their history. Germany alone had practically destroyed Russia several times in the past half century uh, to allow a unified Germany to join a hostile military alliance was not a small step. Gorbachev agreed on a condition. The condition was that NATO would not move one inch to the east beyond Germany. East, and in fact, NATO forces wouldn't even go to East Germany. That was the condition. Perfectly explicit, unambiguous. You want to see the actual wording? Look it up in the online National Security Archives, Georgetown University, which have a, a, a record an authoritative record of the official documents. No ambiguity. Well, Gorbachev agreed to that. Uh, the Bush-Baker administration adhered to it. They adhered to it. Clinton came in a couple years later. The first few years of the Clinton administration, he also adhered to the agreement. By 1994, with his eye on domestic politics, minority group, voting groups, Polish voters, and so on, uh, Clinton began to vacillate, began to offer some hints of the East European countries joining NATO. In 1997, presumably with his eye on the 1998 vote, uh, Clinton agreed, uh, invited, uh, several East European countries on the borders of Russia to join NATO. Well, uh, Boris Yeltsin, who was then president, was very close to Clinton. In fact, Clinton had intervened to have him elected in 1996. Yeltsin bitterly ob objected to this. So did Gorbachev. So did every Russian leader. U.S. statesmen, George Kennan, Jack Matlock, ambas former ambassador to Russia under Reagan, leading Russia specialist in the government, uh, uh, numerous other, Henry Kissinger, numerous others pointed out to Washington, they're making a terrible mistake. I should say that includes 
the current CIA director, William Burns, and former CIA director, Stanfield Turner, uh, William Perry, Secretary of Defense under Clinton, was so outraged by this, he practically resigned in protest. Uh, 50 specialists in Russia wrote a warning letter to Clinton saying, this is extremely dangerous. You should not be doing it. You're just calling on Russia to become militant and aggressive instead of accommodating in a common European home. Well, Clinton went ahead. Uh, uh, George W. Bush, who came later, he just tore it to shreds, invited everyone. 2008, he invited Ukraine to join. That was actually vetoed by Germany and France, but it remains on the table. Everyone, all the people I quoted, high level US diplomats and uh, uh, Russia specialists and so on, understood perfectly that for Russia, there are some definite red lines that no Russian leader will tolerate, none. Yeltsin, Gorbachev, anyone. That's Ukraine and Georgia, right within the Europe, Russian geostrategic heartland, uh, joining a hostile military alliance. They will never accept that. The US forged ahead. The September 2021 policy statement amplifies it, uh, states it explicitly, we will go ahead uh, and we will continue to arm Ukraine. If you want to imagine what that's like from the Russian point of view, understood well by high level US statesmen, as I mentioned, it's as if Mexico were to join a Chinese run military alliance, uh, carry out joint exercises with the Chinese army, place weapons in Mexico uh, aimed at Washington. We wouldn't tolerate that for one second. It would never, not, not Mexico, not anywhere in Latin America can remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Inconceivable. Notice that this is no infringement on the sovereignty of Mexico. Mexico is essentially neutral. It's not part of any military alliance. It has restrictions. It cannot do what I just described. It cannot join a Chinese-run military alliance, carry out military operations with the People's Liberation Army, uh, get training in advanced weaponry from Chinese uh, military experts, place weapons on the uh, border aimed at Washington. Nobody bothers to say this. It's perfectly well understood. Notice that what I've just described is the September 2021 U.S. official policy on Ukraine and Russia. Well, none of that justifies the Russian aggression, which is a kind of crime that ranks with the U.S. invasion of Iraq, the Hitler-Stalin invasion of Poland, other examples of what the Nuremberg Tribunal called the supreme international crime crime of aggression, not in defense. Uh, that's uh, nothing justifies that. But to understand is not to justify. To understand is important if we care about Ukrainians. And even if we care about world peace, because this thing could escalate easily to a major conflict with the US, with NATO, which would go on to a terminal nuclear war. So we should try to understand, and again, recognizing that understanding is not justified. The people I mentioned, like George Kennan, Henry Kissinger, William Perry, uh, 
William Burns, CIA director, many others, are not, Cannon is no longer with us, would not be justifying the Russian aggression when they explain the background for it, in which we play a role and continue to play a role by not joining today in offering, in developing diplomatic options, supporting those that are already on the table. Going back to Ambassador Freeman, that was his point, crucial point. As long as our position backed by England is you're finished, Putin, you're done. War crimes trials, permanent sanctions, no way out for you. We're telling Putin, as Freeman said, I'm quoting him, we're going to fight you to the last Ukrainian. That's not something we should be doing. We should be moving towards peace. We spend a lot of time talking about the kinds of weapons we can provide. Okay, worth doing it. But the real thing we should be talking about is how can we move towards a peaceful settlement which will end this horror, not to the last Ukrainian. And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Joining us is Noam Chomsky, who since his first appearance on this program has written dozens more books. The next call for him comes from Maureen in Toms River, New Jersey. Go ahead, Maureen. Hello, Professor Tomsky. Uh, I'm a great admirer of yours, and it's a pleasure to even speak with you. Um, I wondered about your uh, thoughts and any optimism about the uh, recent um, last year Starbucks location in New York uh, had unionized, and now with the uh, Amazon warehouse in Staten Island union, uh, unionizing, if you would see any of that having an effect and emboldening emboldening the people throughout the country to actually start unionizing and recognizing that they can take this power into their own hands. Thank and you, Maureen. Let's get a response. Professor Chomsky, in case you didn't understand, she t was talking about Amazon unionizing and if you think that's a good sign and your other uh, thoughts about those types of issues. Well, labor has been under bitter attack throughout this whole neoliberal period. You may recall that Reagan's first action was to attack unions using what were internationally regarded as illegal means, scabs, permanent replacement workers. It was a bitter attack on the labor movement. Margaret Thatcher who was carrying out the same programs in England, opened her programs the same way, major attack on unions. That opened the door to private corporations saying, okay, we can do it too. Caterpillar, others launched anti-union activities also using banned, internationally banned methods like scabs and so on. The laws were changed changed to make labor organizing much harder. There is a National Labor Relations Board, which is supposed to protect workers' rights. It was defunded, uh, barely functions. Uh, Bill Clinton came along, another major attack on labor. Uh, the uh, NAFTA, the agreement with uh, Mexico and Canada, was bitterly attacked by the labor movement. Actually, they were in favor of a North of an agreement, but not this one. Labor came forth with a proposal, the Labor Action Committee proposal for a North American free trade agreement, which would uh, be based on the principle of high wages, high growth. They were seconded by the Office of Technology Assessment, Congress's research bureau, which has since been disbanded. Congress doesn't seem to want independent information. 
but it existed then. And they came out with a proposal for NAFTA, very similar to the labor movement proposal, efforts to build a high growth, high wage trade system. Clinton went through with the corporate based system, low wage, low growth, but great for profits. Well, that was NAFTA that was later extended to the what's called the Uruguay round, the World Trade Organization agreements, which have the same properties, could go into the details. It's a bitter attack on the labor movement. In fact, we have some evidence about how great an attack it was. A couple of years after NAFTA, a study was undertaken under NAFTA rules by uh, Kate Bronfenbrenner. She's a labor historian at Cornell University. Uh, under NAFTA rules, took a undertook a study of the effect of NAFTA on union organizing. Turns out that the effect was dire. Uh, the uh, NAFTA, along with the refusal of the government to apply labor laws, led to a very sharp reduction in union organizing by illegal means. Uh, a business could, if there was an effort at organizing, a business could uh, put up uh, a banner saying, transfer operation Mexico, could call in workers for obligatory meetings or would tell them, you go ahead with this union organizing, we're going to move to Mexico. They didn't intend to do it, but the warning was enough. Uh, meanwhile, a major industry had developed of strike breaking. There are now major industries working on what used to be called scientific methods of strike breaking, lots of techniques, uh, many of them illegal, uh, but it doesn't matter if you have a criminal state that doesn't enforce the law. Uh, the effect of all of this over the years has been a sharp decline in the labor movement. This is happening at a time when workers want to unionize. You look at workers' preferences, majority want to be in unions, but unionization declined every year. Again, last year, the density of unionization declines under attack from a state corporate program of attacking labor. That's what it amounts to. Well, going back to the Amazon strike, it's a dramatic break from that, despite the enormous advantages that corporate business system has been given by state criminality, which is what it is, despite the enormous advantages, Amazon workers in Staten Island managed to win an election. They'll be immediately under attack by Amazon, uh, by the kinds of means I've described, but it's a small victory. There are a couple of others. There are signs, small signs of revival of labor. Uh, uh, actually started in non-unionized areas in red states like my state, Arizona, West Virginia, it began with teachers, teachers who are not unionized, began to strike for not just for higher wages, but for better conditions for children. Part of the neoliberal programs has been to defund, defund education to try to destroy the public education system. In fact, under the Trump years, we had a secretary of education who was openly committed to destroying the public education system. Public education is one of the great achievements of American democracy. Back in the late 19th, early 20th century, the United States pioneered, led the world in developing public education, mass public education, and an enormous contribution to democracy and to the health of society. 
It's an American achievement at the university level too. Uh, the uh, uh, grants for universities, uh, unfortunately, taking away Native American land wasn't pretty, but these land grants enabled the establishment of major universities. State, the great United States has great state universities. Uh, MIT, where I taught all my life, was actually a land grant university. Uh, the uh, that uh, was an enormous contribution. During the neoliberal period, it's been under sharp attack. I quoted the crisis of democracy, calling for more indoctrination of the youth or attack on the educational system. There was also defunding. Funding for state colleges and universities has sharply declined, also at the K-12 level, all part of the effort to destroy the, one of the major contributions of the United States towards democracy and public welfare. And it's still continuing. Well, teachers began to strike in the red states, West Virginia, Arizona, calling for better funding for schools. So a teacher doesn't have to sit in front of 50 kids unable to teach because there's no resources and there's no possibility of dealing with the children. Teachers were fighting not just for better salaries, which they richly deserve, but for better, con better conditions for children and schools. They got a lot of support. I happen to be living in Arizona now and drive around Tucson where I live. There were signs on lawns all over the place supporting the teachers, signs on businesses support the teachers. They won referenda. Arizona passed a referendum calling for more funding for the schools, which they vastly, badly need. The Republican legislature won't do it. So the battle continues. But this is a major growth of labor organizing, which extended. It has extended to the major labor movement. Uh, not enormous, statistically <clears throat> speaking, but there have been scattered victories, Starbucks, uh, there was a General Motors victory. Uh, the Amazon is the latest, but there's a long way to go. The National Labor Relations Board has to be reconstituted so that it actually carries out its legal responsibility of defending workers from illegal attacks by business, which have devastated the labor movement since Reagan. Well, the Biden administration has actually been trying to do it, but it's been blocked by 100% rock solid Republican opposition joined by a few right wing Democrats, so it can't get through. Uh, just very recently, a very good representative uh, appointment who was pro labor was blocked. Uh, and uh, there's a big battle to overcome. I should remember, uh, as I said, I'm old enough to remember the early 1930s. And it's kind of similar. The labor movement in the 1920s had been crushed. The United States has a very violent labor history, much worse than Europe. The <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson Red Scare the worst repression in American history had crushed the vibrant militant labor movement. 1920s, there was almost nothing left. Early 1930s, in the wake of the depression, began to revive. CIO organizing, militant labor actions, sit down strikes. Uh, under that impetus, it was a sympathetic administration. The, you got the New Deal measures, which have greatly improved the lives of Americans enormously. 
and led the world to the post-war social democratic movements. Well, maybe it'll begin today, but it's going to be a battle, a major battle. Amazon victory is a striking example of what <clears throat> could be done, but it's going to be a long haul. The attack on labor continues right now, relentless, bitter, and it'll take plenty of dedication and commitment to beat back and overcome it. We have about an hour left with our guest Noam Chomsky this afternoon, and we're gonna to continue to take your calls. Noam Chomsky has appeared on C-SPAN 28 times. National reputation really sprang forth in 1967 when he wrote a uh, responsibility for of intellectuals essay in the New York Review of Books. And it was in 1989 that he gave a lecture on thought control in modern society. Here's a portion of that. Well, the title of this talk, as I suppose you saw somewhere, is Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies. The title is uh, intended to be paradoxical. It should be. Uh, thought control and indoctrination are inconsistent with democracy, therefore one can't have thought control in a democratic society. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is a standard view about this matter. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell, uh, who speaks of what he calls the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process. Now, he happens to be speaking about the media and their crucial role in affecting this societal purpose. And similar re remarks could be made and should be made about the educational system, about publishing, uh, about intellectual life generally. But the media are particularly important in providing free access to information and opinion, and therefore allowing a democratic process to function in a meaningful way. So the media therefore fulfill what uh, the New York Times on Sunday called their traditional Jeffersonian role as a counterbalance to government power. And if one takes Jefferson seriously, as he may or may not have taken himself, uh, he would presumably have gone further, speaking not just of counterbalancing government power, but counterbalancing other concentrations of power, specifically the kinds that developed in the post-Jeffersonian period, uh, corporate power, which is the dominant feature of modern social life. Well, all of this seems obvious, even tautological. What else could be the foundations of democracy? Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view, and it probably is the dominant view among uh, liberal democratic theorists. It goes right back to the origins of modern democracy in the English revolutions of the 17th century, English Revolution of the 17th century, at that time great concern was expressed over popular agitators, uh, itinerant preachers and workers uh, with their little printing presses and their pamphlets and their public speeches, which were removing the cloak of mystery behind which the parliament and the king were carrying out their much narrower struggle, the one you read about in the history books. Uh, now, uh, these people were uh, 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 in their words, they were people who wanted to be represented not by lords and gentry, but by men of their own kind, men who know the people's swords, quoting from Leveller pamphlets. And observing their activities, uh, one contemporary historian warned that by revealing the workings of power, they will make the people so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule, which is a big problem. Well, well after these radical, radical Democrats had been crushed by about 1660, uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, spinsters and dairy maids, must be told what to believe. The greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Now, uh, these concerns arose once again during the American Revolution, uh, as they typically do during popular revolutions. Uh, and uh, uh, 
it was not until the 1780s that the radical Democrats in the American Revolution were crushed and uh, there was no more any thought that people would be represented by people at that time, men of their own kind who know the people's sores. Uh, they would be represented by uh, those qualified to rule over them of whom they were permitted to make a selection, the modern democratic political system. Uh, which follows the principle laid down by the Founding Fathers that those who own the country ought to govern it, uh, quoting John Jay. Uh, now, uh, um, all of this comes right to the present. I won't try to go through the history, but there's a rich tradition expressing these same views. It comes right down to the present. Uh, in the modern version, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, for example, the revered moralist and uh, foreign policy analyst, uh, he explained that, in his words, rationality belongs to the cool observer, uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason, but faith. And this faith relies upon necessary illusion. I thank him for offering me my title. This faith relies upon necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications which have to be provided by the myth makers, by the cool observers, folks like us, smart guys, who know how to serve power. Uh, Walter Lippmann, Dean of American Journalists, a few years earlier, talked about what he called the manufacture of consent, which he said has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And that's appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class, Niebuhr's cool observers. Uh, the same concerns explain a good deal of the fear of radical movements abroad right up to the present. So for example, in the early 19th century, the Tsar of Russia was deeply concerned about the contagion of revolutionary ideas coming from American democracy, which might undermine the conservative world order that he and Metternich and others were presiding over. And a century later, the roles were reversed, but the same ideas were expressed. Uh, at the time when Woodrow Wilson sent troops to join the Western intervention against the Bolsheviks, uh, his Secretary of State, echoing the Tsar a century earlier, warned that the Bolsheviks were appealing, I'm quoting Robert Lansing, were quoting to the were appealing to the proletariat of all countries, to the ignorant and mentally deficient, who by their very numbers are urged to become masters. Uh, the same ideas appear explicitly in the public relations industry. The patron saint of the modern public relations industry, uh, Edward Bernays, received his training in the Creel Commission, which he was a member of, uh, and he later developed the concept of what he called engineering of consent, which he said is the essence of democracy and is something which he practiced, uh, for example, in demonizing the democratic capitalist government of Guatemala uh, when he was working for the United Fruit Company in 19, early 50s, uh, paving the way for the CIA coup, which has turned the place into a charnel house. Uh, the public relations industry from the very beginnings, from the early part of the century, uh, described its task as controlling the public mind, uh, educating the American people about the economic facts of life to ensure a favorable climate for business, and a proper understanding of what Lippmann called the common interests. The public mind is the only serious danger confronting the company, uh, an AT&T executive uh, commented about 80 years ago, uh, and those problems have been addressed ever since. That's the role of the PR industry. There's also an academic twist to all of this. In fact, it's a major theme in the academic social sciences. Uh, one of the uh, leading American political scientists, uh, the sort of major figure in the field of communications, Harold Laswell, uh, wrote uh, uh, an interesting commentary on this in 1933 in the uh, International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences the entry under propaganda. Those were more honest days. People called things what they were. Uh, he wrote an entry under propaganda in which he explained that we must not succumb to democratic dogmatisms 
about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. The best judges are the elites who must be ensured the means to impose their will for the common good. And the means, he said, are a whole new technique of control, largely through propaganda. And it's necessary to do this because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses. Uh, and then he explained why it's particularly important in a democracy. It's not the case, as the naive might think, that indoctrination is inconsistent with democracy. Rather, as this whole line of thinkers observes, it's the essence of democracy. The point is that in a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head and you can control what they do. So you can be a behaviorist. I don't care if they think at all. Uh, you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule. And therefore, you have to control what people think, uh, to, in, for their own good, of course, uh, to ensure that uh, they don't get out of control. And that was Noam Chomsky in 1989, one of 28 appearances Professor Chomsky has made on C-SPAN over the years. He joins us now live from his home in Tucson, Arizona. And the next call for him is from Michael in Miami. Michael, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hello, and uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chomsky, for your humanity um, and your scholarship. Uh, my question, uh, it, 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 if you answer yes, I believe the reason you're doing so is because we here in the South, and I'm calling you from Broward County, which is probably the school district that is under the most attack uh, by a governor and by a lot of the forces you've described in, in covering everything. I don't know if people who haven't read all of your Michael, words, what's your question? Oh, sure. It, it has to do with, uh, we've had our governor actually kind of come out and say that he wished to increase natural COVID herd immunity uh, in order to uh, increase um, uh, what he viewed as a, as a benefit. But it's the very definition when you're pushing something like herd immunity for a fatal disease. That's the definition of criminal eugenic genocide. That's the direct equivalent of using a student to, as the equivalent of small Blankets. Okay, so COVID herd immunity is the question, Governor DeSantis in Florida. Noam Chomsky? Yeah, uh, I, the question is about Governor DeSantis and COVID immunity. COVID herd immunity, yes, sir. Herd immunity. Well, there is unfortunately a uh, powerful anti-vaccination movement in the United States. DeSantis has played a role in it and is not refusing vaccination, but not following policies advised by serious health officials, not Florida, but elsewhere. And I think this is seriously prolonging a significant crisis. About a million Americans have already died. Uh, the uh, hospitals are overflowing with uh, mostly unvaccinated patients. Uh, they, of course, uh, provide a pool for future muta more mutations. Uh, we have the means to, if not eradicate, uh, greatly control and uh, diminish the harm caused by the uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, 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 infections uh, and also to prevent at least to limit the possible mutations which could be much more harmful than what exists now the means exist but they have to be followed if they're not followed There'll be more suffering, more pain, uh, more deaths, more crushing of 
hospitals, many hospitals have literally had to suspend normal operations uh, just because of the overflow of uh, largely unvaccinated uh, patients that are filling up the COVID wards. In a minor way, I even experienced that myself, but uh, it's been serious. So I think uh, it's a major problem. There's a lot to do. Uh, there's more to say about this. Uh, the it's it's critically important to get vaccination uh, advanced in the large regions of the world, which have not had access to vaccines or only limited access. The rich countries, Europe and the United States, in the early part of the this plague have tended to monopolize the vaccines for themselves. Actually, the European record is worse than the US record in this. Biden administration has taken some steps to try to break through the monopolization, large part of which incidentally goes back to the World Trade Organization rules that I mentioned earlier, which provide those are called free trade agreements, but they're not free trade. They provide extreme protectionist measures to ensure very high profits for pharmaceutical corporations, for uh, mega media corporations and others, what are called intellectual property rights, exorbitant patent rights, which allow them to way overcharge and make extraordinary profits, uh, even though in this case of the pharmaceutical industry as much of the research and development is actually done at public expense, including the Moderna vaccine. Uh, but the rules of the mislabeled free trade agreements allow them to have basically monopoly pricing rights. Well, the Germans have been even more adamant in protecting this than we have. But the effect has been to deprive large parts of the world of the vaccines that they need. This is a threat to us as well, not just to them. It means, again, a large pool of unvaccinated people which provide the virus opportunities to mutate as it does rapidly and nobody knows what the next variant might be. We've so far been kind of lucky in that the variants that have appeared over the years have either been highly lethal but not very contagious, like Ebola, or highly contagious but not very lethal, like Omicron. Can't guarantee that that'll continue. Well, the point is, going back to what I said before, the question is, what can we do? Well, what we can do is apply the means that are available, intensive vaccination, uh, protected spaces for people who want to be safe for, from infection, uh, distancing, uh, masks, many mechanisms that can be used to reduce the spread of infection and to uh, ameliorate the crisis, largely overcome it. So we have to pursue those measures. Florida, under DeSantis, does not have a good record on this. Jim's in Caliente, California, and Jim, you're on with Noam Chomsky. Hello, thank you very much for taking my call, and Professor, it's a great honor to talk to you. My question is um, basically the Internet, your, your thoughts on it. Um, um, it's not been that long since it came into being, like the last 20, 25 years. It seems to have taken over the world, so thank you very much. Professor? Didn't quite catch it, I'm oh, sorry. The impact of the Internet over the last 20, 25 years. The impact of the internet. Yes, sir. Uh, 
it's quite a story. I was actually present at the origin of what is now the internet. I was in the 1950s. I was uh, at the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT, which is where the early ideas were formulated. It uh, became what was called the ARPANET. Uh, it uh, later turned into the internet. It's interesting that to remember that almost um, the internet was overwhelmingly, like computers generally, uh, developed on public funding. It was a publicly, largely publicly created uh, uh, achievement. Later, it was privatized, handed over to private power for profit. But that was many years later, into the 90s. Uh, the internet has now become a major phenomenon. Well, it has mixed consequences. The internet does allow us to discover things that we otherwise would not have known. It offers tremendous access to information. I mean, for years I've worked on many years, 50 years, back to the article you mentioned, been working on uh, how the media operate as a kind of combination of an information and indoctrination system, combination of both. Well, I used to have to go to the library and look up, uh, uh, work with microfilm machines to try to find out what was in the New York Times, and, you know, two years ago. Now I can do it by clicking a button. Uh, you can find things that you never would have found. Like I quoted before, a crucially important document, crucially important, September 2021, U.S. government policy statement on, your, on Ukraine. You can find that on the internet. You're not going to find it in the media. Even if you went to libraries, you wouldn't find it. But now you can pick it up from the White House official page on the internet. And that magnifies. It's a tremendous source of potential information and enlightenment. But I stress potential. It matters how you use it. And unfortunately, it's often used to limit understanding and to restrict information. There's a natural tendency, I can understand it, partially share it, to turn at once towards the internet sites which reinforce your own positions. I know I'm going to hear the kinds of things I like, so I'll turn to that. And that tends to create bubbles, small bubbles of self-reinforcing uh, doctrines and ideas where people become not only ignorant on what's the outside, but even immune to it because they're hearing and getting reinforced by what they want to hear. That's a very a widespread phenomenon. I think we're all familiar with it. And it's quite dangerous. It's uh, undermining the possibilities of interchange and interaction across the society, which are a prerequisite for a functioning de democratic society based on an informed electorate, uh, aware of the views of others, understanding the views of others, able to move forward. That's the basis of a healthy society. That's pretty much what it was like during the exciting New Deal period. During the 1960s, it was also true over a very wide range of the, at the time, mostly younger population. Uh, I was in my 40s at the time, so I was one of the old folks. But uh, the... Uh, uh, this is uh, this is deteriorating. So while the internet 
could be uh, a mechanism of liberation and enlightenment. It can also be an instrument of control, indoctrination, uh, divisiveness, uh, breakdown of social order. It has all that potential. It's kind of like a lot of technology. I take a hammer. A hammer doesn't care whether you use it to build a house or whether a torturer uses it to crush somebody's skull. The hammer's indifferent. And a lot of technology is like that. The internet is an example. Can be an enormous force for enlightenment, liberation, mutual aid and mutual understanding. But we have to make that decision. The internet's not gonna make it for us. John is calling in from El Paso, Texas. Please go ahead, John, you're on Book TV. I hope you don't mind if I change my question. I, I first asked if, was going to ask if the United Nations could solve the problems in Yemen and and uh, and Afghanistan and Ukraine, but now I'm really concerned with whether or not you think that um, uh, economic sanctions are an act of war. Did you catch that, Professor? Well, it's worth remembering that sanctions, if sanctions are carried out by the United Nations, they're legal. We can ask whether they're advisable, but they're at least legal. Most of the sanctions are carried out by the United States. Actually, more than more than half the world's population is now under one or another form of U.S. sanctions. These have no legal authority. The United States is using sanctions wildly to punish people, sometimes with some justification, maybe sometimes not. But it should, there, there, we do not want a world, at least I don't want a world, in which one power, which happens to have enormous force and a, a behind it, is capable of deciding who gets sanctioned. That's not a livable world. Sometimes the sanctions are grotesque. Take Cuba. For 60 years, Cuba has been under direct attack by the United States. Began with the Kennedy administration. Uh, Kennedy carried out a major terrorist war against Cuba. Not much discussed here, but it was real and very serious. It's part of what led to the missile crisis that almost destroyed us. Uh, then harsh sanctions were imposed. Well, they continue. When uh, Russian support was withdrawn and Cuba faced really serious uh, problems because that was the limited support it was getting under the harsh U.S. sanctions regime. At that moment, the Clinton admin, Bill Clinton outflanked the Republicans from the right, from the right by increasing the sanctions, increasing the torture. And then came the Helms-Burton law, which made it even worse. U.S. sanctions are what are called third party sanctions. Others have to adhere to U.S. sanctions, even if they oppose them. And in the case of Cuba, dramatically, the whole world opposes them strenuously. You take a look at the votes, annual votes in the United Nations on the Cuba sanctions. They are condemned every year. By now, they're condemned by everyone. The last vote was 184 to two. Two were the United States and Israel, which has to follow U.S. orders, it's client state. Uh, actually doesn't even observe the sanctions, but has to vote with the United States. Why do other countries observe U.S. sanctions, even though they oppose them? 
because they're afraid of the United States. It's a frightening country. Europe opposes the sanctions. It opposes the Iran sanctions vigorously, but it has to go along because you can't step on toes of the United States. It's dangerous. In fact, the United States has the capacity to throw countries out of the international financial system, which mostly runs through New York and can carry out other measures. Nobody's willing to face that. So uh, countries uh, can't provide, say, Sweden medical equipment to Cuba. They can't uh, sell something that uses nickel that they imported from Cuba. What's the reason for this? Well, one of the good things about the United States is it's quite an open society, much more so than others. We have a lot of information about what our government is doing. Not perfect, but a lot. A lot of material gets declassified, unlike other countries. That's a very good thing. So we can look back to the records of the Kennedy and Johnson administration in the 1960s and ask why the torture of Cuba, and it is torture. Well, the reason is, I'm quoting, successful defiance of US policies going back to the 1820s, to the Monroe Doctrine, which established the US right to dominate the hemisphere, to turn the hemisphere into a sphere of influence, as it's called, for the United States. Well, back in the 1820s, the United States wasn't powerful enough to implement it. Britain was much more powerful and impeded the US. But over time, as predicted by US leaders, John Quincy Adams, others, uh, British power waned, American power increased, and finally the US was able to impose the Monroe Doctrine. Cuba was acting in successful defiance of US hot demand to dominate the hemisphere and to determine what happens here. So we have to torture them, make them suffer bitterly and brutally, and Europe joins in Ever the whole world joins in because they're afraid of the United States. Well, that's sanctions. Same with the sanctions on Iran. The, there was an agreement, JCPOA, the Joint Agreement on Nuclear Weapons, signed under the Obama administration, 2015. Iran lived up to it completely. US intelligence, confirms that Iran completely lived up to the agreement. It sharply limited Iran's capacity to develop nuclear systems. Whether they intended to develop nuclear weapons, we don't know. They said they weren't. Maybe they were. But anyway, this limited it. President Trump dismantled it, tore it to shreds, violating Security Council orders. Security Council had ordered that all countries maintain the JCPOA. Trump decided, I don't want like it, I'm gonna tear it apart. So he destroyed it. And then he punished Iran for the US violation of Security Council orders by imposing harsh sanctions on Iran. Europe bitterly opposed that but they have to conform for the reasons I mentioned. That's maintained. It's now maintained by the Biden administration. There is a chance that we might be able to restore the agreement. Tricky thing. Well, we can look through the rest of the world. Sanctions are, there are UN sanctions, which again, one can debate whether they're right or wrong, but at least they're, they're legitimate. But uh, US sanctions have no legitimacy, nor would those of other countries, if other countries were capable of imposing them, to a limited extent they do, but not much. It's mostly 
a U.S. weapon, uh, and we could, we rich should look into them closely. Uh, take the, there are some about which we have extensive evidence if we want to learn. So take the Clinton administration, Clinton Blair, U.S. U.K. sanctions on a, on Iraq in 19, in the 1990s very harsh sanctions. They were administered through the UN, but they were basically US-British sanctions. Well, the first administ there were distinguished uh, international diplomats who administered the sanctions. The first was an Irish diplomat, Dennis Halliday. He resigned in protest because he said the sanctions were genocidal. He said they're, they're bitterly harming Iraqi civilians. Hundreds of thousands of children are dying. Many others are economies being destroyed and they're not harming Saddam Hussein. In fact, he's gaining because the population is suffering and has to shelter under the umbrella of the brutal government, which did have an effective rationing policy. So it's strengthening the tyrant, harming the population to the point where it's genocidal. So he resigned. He was replaced by another distinguished international diplomat, Hans von Sponek. He had researchers all over the country finding and observing what was happening, knew more about Iraq than anybody in the West. He resigned in protest because, as he put it, the sanctions are genocidal. He reiterated and strengthened what Dennis Halliday had said. He also published an important book. It's called A Different Kind of War, in which he described in detail the brutality and sadism of the US British sanctions and what they were doing to the population while they were strengthening the tyrant. Well, we're not a fascist country, so the book isn't technically banned, but try to find it. I don't think there's a single review in the United States or in Britain, just silenced. Uh, it's there and worth reading. You can find out in detail extensive detail what sanctions are like when they're applied in a brutal and sadistic manner. And they, you can't prove it, but von Sponek kind of suggests, and I think there's some plausibility to this, that the sanctions may have saved Saddam from being overthrown from within. That happened to a lot of tyrants brutal US-backed tyrants. Marcos in the Philippines, Duvalier in Haiti, Ceausescu in Romania, the worst of the gangsters in the Soviet system, very strongly supported by the United States until virtually the day of his overthrow. Uh, the uh, one after another were toppled by internal revolts. Same thing happened in South Korea. Possibly it could have happened in Iraq, but not under the conditions of the sanctions, which so punished the population and demoralized them, and so forced them to shelter under the Saddam umbrella that there was no possibility of overthrow the government. Can't prove it, but that might have happened. Well, that's one case of sanctions where we can learn a great deal. Von Sponek's book is very detailed and instructive, but we can only learn it if we try. If we decide we just want to accept the indoctrination, okay, then it doesn't matter that it's a free country. Well, there are other cases you can look at. Uh, the usual discussion of sanctions is, do they achieve their ends? So discussion of the 
there's a lot of criticism of the Iran sanctions, public criticism in the United States, because they didn't work. They didn't force Iran to accept US demands. It's not the right question. The right question is, what right does the United States have to destroy the agreement in violation of Security Council orders, and then to punish Iran because we destroyed the agreement? That's the question that should be asked. What right do we have to compel others to adhere to our decision to punish Iranians because we withdrew from the agreement? Those are the questions that could be asked. And similar questions can be asked in other cases. Cuba is the obvious one, Venezuela, others. And remember, US sanctions are so widespread that they actually reach over half the world's population. I, before in the early part of this discussion, I quoted Chaz Freeman, again, one of the most highly regarded, rightly highly regarded members of the US diplomatic corps, ambassador. He also in the same interview I described, goes into the illegality and cruelty of the sanctions. It's worth listening to and worth thinking about. And in Professor Chomsky's book, Who Rules the World? There is a chapter that is entitled, The U.S. is a Leading Terrorist State. We have five minutes left with our guests, Kathy and Albuquerque. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I just, uh, the one issue that weighs heavily on my mind is um, immigration. And I have a feeling it's only gonna get worse because of the climate, you know, because of global warming. And I don't know if there's anything we can do to make it better. I don't think we should turn these people away because they're desperate situations. It's not easy to leave a place they, you know, they're unfamiliar with and go somewhere. But um, I don't know if you agree also that it's going to get worse because of the global warming and what we can do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I sort of half got it, but not sure I got it completely. Could you repeat the essence? She is concerned about immigration, and she thinks it's going to get worse because of global climate change? Well, immigration is an interesting question. We don't have much time, but one thing we might do is look at the U.S. record on immigration. The U.S. is in an unusual position. It has extraordinary advantages, very low population density, enormous resources, huge empty spaces. So what's our history on immigration. Well, up until the 20th century, immigrants were welcomed from Europe, white immigrants. Why? Not a pretty story. We were wiping out and exterminating the indigenous populations. Country was being opened up for settlement. We needed lots of white faces to come in and settle it. 1920, your Orientals were blocked. There was an Oriental Exclusion Act, 1882. 1924, the US imposed its first strict immigration restriction. The words weren't used, but in effect, it was aimed at Italians and Jews. That's the effect and the design of the Immigration Act of 1924. Many Jews ended up in extermination camps because they couldn't get into the United States. Happens to include the remnants of my extended family, but that's the least of it. This law stayed until 1965. Other arrangements were made, which are worth discussing. I have no time for it. Today, the U.S. has a it's not alone. Europe is even worse. Europe has even more brutal anti-immigration policies than the United States. You know, Europe has spent centuries devastating and destroying Africa. It's now working hard to ensure that people escaping, trying to escape 
from the wreckage of European savagery can't make it to European shores. Uh, Europe even has uh, military installations in Central Africa, Niger, to try to pretend Sub-Saharan Africa, to try to pretend, prevent miserable refugees from even making it to the Mediterranean where they might enter European shores. So if you want to feel good about it, Europe's even worse, but our policies are horrendous. People who are fleeing from the destruction of their societies by US terror under Reagan in the 1980s, murderous terror operations killed hundreds of thousands of people, um, hundreds of thousands of refugees, orphans, widows, meant much of it has extended People are trying to escape uh, the Honduras. There was a military coup in 2009, condemned by almost the entire continent, accepted by Obama and Hillary Clinton, who basically supported it, turned Honduras even to more of a horror chamber than it had been, led to a huge wave of flight. We now turn them back at the border or separate parents from children at the border under Trump. It's disgraceful. Uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, properly said that the refugee crisis is not a refugee crisis. It's a moral crisis of the wealthy, of the rich, of the West. Well, the question, questioner <laughs> pointed out that it's going to get much more extreme. We are now intensifying the threat and danger of global warming, which will be devastating. It'll lead to huge flight. Countries like say Bangladesh are gonna become unlivable. Most of South Asia is literally gonna become virtually unlivable. Large parts of Africa. What are the people gonna do? They're gonna to have to flee. Hundreds of millions of people will be trying to flee. Not so great here either. In Arizona, where I live, there's a long mm -hmm. drought that may have very severe consequences, but it's nothing like the poorer countries of the world. They're gonna be shattered by this. And yes, there will be enormous immigration problems. The way to deal, deal with it is to stop immediately our assault on the global environment. We are just, destroying the environment which can sustain life on earth. We must start immediately following the strong advice of the scientific community, <laughs> the IPCC, that we cut back fossil fuels right away, certain percentage every year, right away till we end the use of fossil fuels within a couple of decades. And if not, we're finished, okay? Professor Chomsky, Absolutely. we're gonna have to end it there. We're gonna close with this quick text message to you. Few speak and have spoken for decades with conscience woven throughout their remarks and writings in the matter of Dr. Chomsky. Professor Chomsky has two new books coming out this year. One is Chomsky, A New World in Our Hearts, and Notes on Resistance, both coming out this year. And he, Noam Chomsky, has been our guest for the past two hours on In Depth. Thank you very much. Now, if you any of this program, it's going to re air very shortly. Next, Book TV's monthly in depth program with author and professor Noam Chomsky. His books include Hope.